Good afternoon. My name is Sakina Moore, and I'm the program director of the Monuments Toolkit Project. In honor of World Heritage Day, World Heritage USA, United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, and the Monument Toolkit Project would like to welcome you to this month's webinar, Controversial Monuments on Retrial. For over 40 years, World Heritage Day, established by the International Council of Monuments and Sites, encourages the global community to connect with cultural, cultural and historical resources in the local community and beyond. World Heritage USA is headquartered in Washington, D.C., which is the traditional territory of the Nakota, the Anacostan, and the Piscataway people. It is not merely enough to do a land acknowledgement, but how do we support indigenous communities into the future? With the Monuments Toolkit Project, we are looking at legacies that our societies uphold and are making the links to social injustice, health injustice, and economic injustice that these monuments have come to symbolize. We do this by uplifting stories that were ignored and untold by inviting conversations as we get into these uncomfortable places. We will offer a toolkit for communities that are facing controversial and oppressive monuments, whether it is removal, reinterpretation, or recontextualization. We would like to thank the Mellon Foundation for their generous support without which our work would not be possible. We also invite you to visit www.worldheritageusa to sign up and receive updates on the work that we're doing. Again, welcome. And I want to introduce you to William Humphrey, Program Associate for Research and Publications, who will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is William Humphrey, and I am working as the Program Associate for research and publications on the World Heritage USA's Monuments Toolkit. In celebration of World Heritage Day, also known as the International Day for Monuments and Sites, World Heritage USA is collaborating with uh, two parties for this webinar. The first being the Alliance for the Restoration of Cultural Heritage, or Arch International, and Budapest Hungary's Memento Park. Both of these parties have invested into the development of unique strategies towards the assessment of problematic monuments in their communities. World Heritage Day is the annual celebration of cultural heritage around the world and highlights the importance and need to protect cultural heritage sites for future generations. The theme for this year is Heritage Changes. And this theme captures the importance of incorporating local and traditional knowledge systems, uh, examining the current happenings within the heritage sectors, and our abilities to tackle and mitigate the effects of climate change with innovation and inclusivity. When I personally imagine the theme heritage changes, the innovation and gusto needed to redefine what a monument entails captures the essence of development and inclusivity for this year's theme. But in addition to these best practices, I also consider the elements of heritage that are inseparable. What I see in my perspective is that pain follows the removal, suppression, and rewriting of culture. Those moments in history that shape our interpretations of the figures and sites in our towns, our regions, and different countries are just as crucial as the interpersonal values of cultural heritage. In this light, narrative and tradition can be molded by pain, but also memory and history. There is much to be gained with the contemporary transformation of public space with the new ideas and presentations we've shown thus far. So today we ask, whom, are, whom were the figures that stand meant to represent? And are they relevant to our values and communities today? Do the narratives that they represent dominate their presence or is there an incentive in preventing their destruction? 
These are some of the questions that we'll cover in the following presentations. For our first guest, I'm introducing the representatives for Arch International. Starting with Dr. Cheryl Bernard. Dr. Cheryl Bernard on the left studied Islamic studies and international relations at the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, and holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Vienna, Austria. She was a senior analyst and program director in the National Security Research Division of the RAND, RAND Corporation. At RAND, she worked on issues of counterterrorism, national security, and post-conflict reconstruction. Before joining RAND Corporation, she was a senior analyst and program director for European and US think tanks. She is the author of more than 20 books about the Middle East and post-conflict societal reconstruction, including Veiled Courage, Civil Democratic Islam, and Women in Peacebuilding. Dr. Bernard founded Arch International in 2009 as a consequence of being continually impressed during her travels with the resilience and creativity of individuals and groups who were determined to hold on to treasured aspects of their culture, even under the most trying opponent. They, oh, even under the most trying circumstances. Most often they were up against a vastly superior opponent, but they still did not give up. And as a member of a military family, she grew up in post-World War II Europe, where she saw destroyed cities rise anew and populations take hope from the rebuilding of their monuments, buildings, and traditions. I'm also welcoming on the right, Sophia A. Schultz. Sophia Schultz is the director of the international programs at Arch International. Her journey into a career in cultural heritage management began with her interest in contemporary art and the Middle East. Ms. Schultz's involvement with Arch began shortly after the founding of the nonprofit while she was a Master of Science in Middle East Politics postgraduate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS, in London, UK. Before that, she completed her bachelor's in cultural sciences at the U European University via Drina, close to Berlin. Earlier in her career, Ms. Schultz worked in media, monitoring media related to the Middle East, terrorism, and United States foreign policy. As part of her work for a women-led foundation promoting freedom of speech in Iran, she focused on creating platforms for Iranian artists and civil society members. She has published essays and art catalogs and worked on contemporary art and film projects, such as Reach, Crafts, Move, Position, Apply Force in 2015, by artist Kasha Dalberg and is a member of the selection committee of the San Diego Latino Film Festival. Please welcome them both to the webinar. Hello from, from Arch International. I will start. Um, I will just go to our presentation. I will share my screen. So today we will um, introduce a handbook that our organization developed. And before we go into the handbook, I wanted to give a quick introduction of the context around developing this handbook. Um, we work, Arch International is a nonprofit organization based in the US with international projects around the world where we work with communities um, that face difficulties um, in usually con in conflict zones or post-conflict. And um, we work with the communities to rescue and save the heritage that they are defending in their own uh, in their own local communities in Iraq, in Afghanistan, also in Greece, in um, Austria. So there's a, there's a lot of countries. You can visit our website to see our projects. And um, the website is here on the screen. And we have faced uh, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, everyone will remember the destruction of the Bami and Buddhas. Um, in Iraq, we uh, so we advocated for the rebuilding of the Bami and Buddhas. 
And we notice that, that cultural heritage and monuments have a lot of values attached to them. It's intangible heritage, it's tangible heritage. And it's, it's a very complex issue if you go deeper into search, if you research kind of one of the monuments. Um, with Bamiyan, there's a lot of, um, for example, the, com the local community, for them, they had their own folklore around the Buddha figures. It wasn't a Buddhist site in the sense, it, it sounds like it was a Buddhist site, but it wasn't for the local community, but then for others, for other local community members, it was um, offensive from an Islamic from an Islamic perspective that someone would worship another religion uh, in their community. So we always work with different stakeholders. We try to find compromises. In um, in Iraq, we restored the shrine of an Old Testament prophet, Prophet Nahum. Um, he's a biblical prophet buried in uh, in Iraq, and it's. It was historically speaking, it was mainly a Jewish heritage site, even though it was an interfaith heritage site for the people. Still to this day, it is it is an interfaith heritage site. Um, and again, a lot of different communities, viewpoints, perspectives come together. So in 2020, I'm gonna go to the next oh, in 2020, um, now we are back in the United States is when um, the, the protests erupted, erupted around uh, social justice issues. And some of, some of those protests were then directed against certain monuments and statues. And that's when we kind of looked into it more and we, we, we tried to develop a method to address this issue. Um, some things that we noticed back then is that sometimes the wrong statues um, kind of in the heat of the moment uh, there was in North Carolina, for example, um, a statue by a General Lee that was that was taken down, and then after it was taken down, people noticed it was it wasn't Robert E. Lee; it was William Lee, a different general who fought in the Second World War. Um, and so we, there was there was other examples too, where people were kind of the um, input, the mob rule or people kind of on the street act in a certain way. So we as a cultural heritage preservation organization, um, we, yeah, we had to react in, in a more, um, yeah, we, we thought it, there must be more creative, innovative ways to interpret heritage um, that doesn't necessarily uh, involve destruction and complete uh, erasure, erasure of, of something that has, has been there before and that can be discussed. Um, even though it's, it's disputed. Um, it's also, um, there's a lot that one can learn from history. In Germany, um, there's a lot of, war there's history that's connected to wars. If everything would be erased, we wouldn't be able to learn from it um, anymore. If, yeah. Um, so I think I will, because we don't have that much time, go to, yeah, give the word to Cheryl. Yeah. So as Sophia said, the heat of the moment in, in our thinking was not the, the right moment to decide on the fate of a monument or site. And mob destruction was probably not the optimal mechanism. So we thought, well, what could be a template instead for dealing with monuments that were upsetting to the community, contested within a community, sometimes not contested, sometimes there was uniformity of opinion, but not no certainty of what should happen to it. And as a thought experiment, we, we thought, well, maybe a criminal trial is actually a pretty good template for this because it includes a process. And the more we thought about it, the more apt actually this analogy struck us to be in, in discussions of, of monuments and sites as well. So the steps, the typical steps in a criminal procedure are you start with an accusation. So what is it that this statue, the person represented by this statue, this monument, what, what is the accusation against them? Why are they seen as disturbing uh, or upsetting? Why are, people, um, why are people disputing its right to occupy that space in their municipality? So the accusation. Then, all right, then you decide, yes, that accusation is valid. You could call that the arrest. You decide that you're going to focus on this object or this site. Next, you need jury selection. That's the question that comes up when these monuments are concerned. Who is going to make the decision? So you could kind of call that group the jury. And 
the criteria, I think, are very similar to what you want in a jury. You want people who commit themselves to agree that they're going to be objective about it, that they're going to listen to the different perspectives, that they're going to consider the various arguments fairly, that they're maybe not too close to the problem, uh, that they won't be able to be neutral. So you, you, pick a, you pick peers, you pick normal members of the community, but such that, that are understanding that they're by, by joining that jury, they're agreeing that they're going to be objective. Then the statute, has to enter a plea or on its behalf you 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 say okay well yes this uh, this individual did commit the, the problematic social political or other behaviors that he or she is accused of and then the person advocating on their behalf might say but they also did these good things they did helpful things to the community they invented something that was incredibly valuable to humanity they discovered something or the other so you you bring the pros and cons about that personality to to weigh them then you have deliberations once you've got all these facts on the table and you have the closing arguments for and against the accusation being guilty or not guilty and then you come to the sentencing, and that's what defines the outcome for that object or statue. And actually, the roster of outcomes is quite similar to in a criminal case. You have the death penalty. This object or statue is going to be completely destroyed. You have imprisonment or removal to some basement storage unit somewhere. You have sort of a public shaming, as one used to do, in, especially in colonial days and still in some judicial systems. Or you have restitution. You know, In the case of a, a statue or a site, it could be that it has to deliver educational content, that rather than being now something which is honored and respected, it has to be instead used to explain a very problematic, negative, shameful part of its country's history or its group's history. So, um, so, so, so that's that. That is the panoply of possibilities for sites. As a cultural heritage organization, that, as Sophia explained, mostly is engaged in trying to help people rescue some site that's in danger, and as a group that's very focused on extreme history, very broad, long history, we tend to be opposed to the death penalty for a number of reasons that I will briefly go into now. First of all, if you eliminate a site or even a statue or a monument, it represents a loss of knowledge. Maybe not in the short term when everybody is very familiar with this history and you know it all already very well, only too well, but in the very long term, uh, an example that comes to mind maybe is Ashurbanipal, who was in the you know 600s BC, uh, an incredible tyrant who was a slaughterer of hundreds of thousands of, of people. His statues, monuments, and inscriptions remain and are, for historians, the only resource for an entire period of history. So if that had been obliterated because of the terrible things that he undeniably did, we would be losing an entire chunk of history, not about him alone, not even mainly about him, but about other nations, peoples, minorities, uh, things that happened during that entire time period. So there's there's that to be considered. But even in the short term, you risk losing truths about uncomfortable, terrible truths, but truths that we all really need to remember, especially if we're hoping not to repeat them. Um, I think that there is a tendency to regard, you know, because from a municipal context, that is how it is, but we tend to regard a statue as an honor, to have a statue in your name put up is an honor. But when times change, that really is no longer necessarily the case. For example, today, if statues of Saddam Hussein were still present, most of them, all of them that people could get their hands on were torn down in Baghdad and elsewhere. But today, if you look at that statue, you wouldn't think anymore, oh, this is the grand and glorious Saddam Hussein. You would remember what happened to him and how he was found in a dugout somewhere and then dragged out and put in jail and put on trial and executed. So he would be the reminder of a, of a, a, a despotic regime that, that took place there rather than seen as a hero. And similarly, how tragic would it be if in the immediate 
post-World War II period, one had decided that one wanted to get rid of Auschwitz and other concentration camps because one wanted to obliterate any memory of that terrible Holocaust episode. But how important are those sites today for school children and others to go to and to, to see that, yes, this was in fact a reality. This isn't just something they read about in a book or saw in a movie. This was a reality where people actually uh, suffered this and were, were, were hideously murdered and where this, this terrible Nazi regime operated. So you have to be careful not to lose the educational and the knowledge content of something just for the momentary satisfaction of having obliterated, you know, it, uh, somebody who represents an enemy and, and someone who did some, some extremely bad things. So, um, so I, think, I think what's important to remember too is that in addition to that death penalty, there are a number of other options that, that perhaps satisfy the goal of dealing with this problematic history uh, in, a, in an even better way. And Sophia is going to show us a few of those. So these are a few examples of um, remembering or like monuments uh, around the world. This one is in the USA. Um, what, what is special about this specific um, memorial is that all parties that were involved in this war um, are represented and have a voice. Um, and I'm just going to go through it fast. Or I don't know how much time we have left. I think we're good. Okay, yeah. Um, this one is uh, in Scotland. It's um, it's a very interesting story. It's a statue of the Duke of Wellington. And in one night, a few students that came from a bar in the middle of the night, they put a cone, a traffic cone on the head of this um, of the Duke, of the statue. And then it was removed the next day from the city cleaning teams. Um, and it just became a... Um, kind of a public performance or a public spectacle um, to ridicule or to it, it eventually different political moments are represented here. You see the mask from um, COVID or so people would use that statue kind of to, to, to have a diet, to speak in, in a public uh, realm. The city didn't like it uh, in the beginning. They wanted to raise the statue higher. They wanted to spend a lot of money on um, raising it so people couldn't reach it anymore. But then there was public petitions um, with lots of signatures and eventually the city gave in and then it became a tourist attraction and there's even t-shirts being sold uh, or merchandise around this this duke um, so there's also a way of empowerment uh, around statues that the public can engage with them it's, it's not i think sometimes it's seen as very um kind of as, as if it's in a, a static as if, yeah in a static a static way um, this is Iraqi Kurdistan, the north of Iraq. Um, these are two examples of dealing with uh, history in different ways. Um, Saddam, Saddam Hussein committed genocide, or the, the regime around Saddam Hussein in Iraq committed genocide against the Kurds uh, in Iraq. And on the left, you see the old police station that was also used as a torture facility um, by the regime um, against the Kurdish population of Iraq. Um, it, it is now turned into a museum um, where in very, you can even hear the audio of some of the prisoners, the torture. So it's very much trying to um, show what happened during that time. In Erbil, um, another, uh, yeah, also in Iraqi Kurdistan, another city, they dealt with it differently. They built a, a huge park. This is a lake and a park that you see on this photo. Um, there's lots of picnics going on and little uh, stands where people sell food and it's recreational. People go running in that park. So they try. So there's different ways of dealing with um, with history and remembering. This is um, sorry the quality of the picture. This is a statue by Kehinde Wiley. Kehinde Wiley is the artist. He he made that that statue. Um, it's called Rumors of War, and it is currently in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia has uh, an avenue or kind of a yeah, an avenue of different Confederate uh, statues. And, all on horseback. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, all, all on horseback. Um, so Kehinde Wiley, what he kind of did is reclaim, it's, it's also, um, it's a, yeah, a figure on a, on a horse, but it's reclaimed. It's, there's way more movement in it, the facial expression. Um, it's definitely, this. if someone goes to that avenue, 
they will stop at this statue and look at it. Um, they won't be interested. The Confederate statues are, yeah, will be boring. ignored. <laughs> boring, exactly. So he kind of reclaims a space by using kind of the same visual um, tools and also similar materials. And I think, yeah, this is the last one. Um, this one is in Vienna, in Austria. Um, this is a project to remember the, uh, in a specific district, I think it's the ninth district of the city. Um, had, that district has a history of um, Jewish, um, of a Jewish population that lived in that district. And during the Second World War, um, they were deported, persecuted, had to leave that area. So this project remembers the Jewish, pop the Jewish residents of that district in, in, a, in an art installation, which is uh, the keys. What you see on that image are keys with tags on them. Um, and each key stands for one of those um, houses where, the Jew where Jews lived in, in, Aust in Vienna, in Austria. In Germany, in Berlin, that's where I currently live, um, we have stumble stones, um, Stolpersteine. And it's, it's also um, to remember, they, they are placed, they are stones in the pavement that are placed in front of the houses where Jews were deported with uh, the names and the date. Um, so that if, if you just pass by a house, you can see those, um, those stones and you're, rem you're reminded of that history. And um, people polish them and try to keep them clean. Sometimes there's candles next to those stones. So there's also a public interaction with that, with that monument, uh, with that. Yeah. And there, and we would stop there. And um, we'd love to uh, talk to you about this. Thank you both for your presentation. Next, I would like to introduce Judy Andrea Hope. Judy Andrea Hope is a tourism expert, a storyteller tour guide who has been working in the travel industry for 22 years. In this period of time, Judy tried herself in every possible field of the hospitality business. She managed a restaurant, a wine and chocolate specialty shop, organized educational and leisure trips, worked in tourism product development, gained success in sales, showed excellence in customer care, tried herself as a journalist, and has always been a dedicated tour guide of her beloved city, Budapest. Judy finished her studies as an econ economist in tourism and hospitality at the Budapest Business School, University of Applied Sciences, and attended a semester for business management in Koper, Slovenia, at the University of Primorska. In her early professional life, she used to work and live in Greece and Slovenia. She started working for the company supporting the operation of Memento Park and the Buddha Tower 14 years ago and she has been a managing partner for four years. Judy is responsible for daily operational tasks, such as HR, PR, and communication, customer care, group arrivals, tour guiding, project development, product development, training and education, cultural collaborations, or anything that comes up with the organization. The management is made of herself and the managing director. So taking care of two tourist attractions keeps them fresh, keeps Judy fresh, focused, and busy. Judy is also a mother of two active sons and enjoys doing sports with them. She's a devoted hiker too, a mushroom and herb expert. Therefore, she prefers to spend her free time in the forest. Fortunately, Memento Park is situated next to two natural resorts. So she very often begins her workday with a fulfilling forest walk. Please welcome Judy to the presentation. Thank you, William, for the uh, introduction and a warm welcome uh, to the uh, audience from Budapest. It's uh, almost half past nine here. So for uh, so apologies for not being super fresh and uh, uh, like uh, super off to date, but I try to do my best, although I am after <laughs> a bit long work day. Uh, so uh, 
my second um, thanks goes uh, to uh, Cheryl and Sophie, because without them, I couldn't be here. Without them, uh, we uh, I couldn't hold this presentation for you about Memento Park, about a place that I uh, have been working for 14 years now. And uh, now I'm going to share my screen. And uh, William, I, if I make it, like if, if I fail, then please help me out, okay? <laughs> because... Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So is it any good? Yep, it's all here. Thank you. So then I just start. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what is Memento Park uh, Budapest? It is. Uh, the final location, as you can see, of controversial monuments from the communist era in Hungary. Um, I, I, I don't know much about uh, American history, so I don't expect, uh, expect you to know a lot about European or Hungarian history. So that's why just very briefly, uh, I want to uh, give you the, the frames of time uh, that uh, we are uh, actually will speak about and we are going to move within. Hungary is in a uh, special uh, historical situation, uh, mostly for its uh, geographical location. Hungary is uh, just to see my palm, let's say that my palm is continental Europe and uh, Hungary is in the central part of it, so it is in a buffer zone and uh, that's why it uh, has most probably seen and suffered more than uh, other countries uh, in the rest uh, of uh, the continent and uh, it also brought my country uh, to very hard decisions uh, which well um, the time um, will answer if uh, they were uh, good responded with good or bad decisions uh, so Hungary is in a special situation because, uh, believe it or not, but uh, this uh, small state in the middle of Europe is uh, the second one to proclaim a uh, communist republic as early as 1919. And uh, those uh, very short period, 133 days, did not leave behind uh, any uh, physical objects. That left behind uh, more like... Um, spiritual heritage and uh, a very heavy uh, history that Hungary um, carried uh, until the Second World War and uh, actually even uh, a bit after that. The second communist state uh, was proclaimed in Hungary after the Second World War, uh, but we technically call uh, the era from 1945 until 1990, until the fall of communism, uh, the communist era. And uh, I know that you know that it's more uh, complex than that. I use the word communism and communist era because it is easy to understand, but uh, we all know that it wasn't that easy and it wasn't that simple and uh, that um, this uh, um, social and uh, economic ideology called communism was uh, badly exploited by politicians. So what we're going to speak about is uh, Memento Park Budapest, where, you are, where uh, visitors can see those 41 former communist political propaganda statues that used to populate the streets of Budapest from the communist era from roughly 1945 until 1990. And uh, just let me stay a bit more uh, in this uh, period or era of Hungary. Um, my country saw two miracles uh, during these 45 years in the darkest century in the history of Hungary and the mankind. Hungary first saw the 1956 uprising in 1956, and uh, 
just a few decades later, the establishment of Memento Park Budapest in 1990. Here you see, I don't think that I have to uh, introduce him to the uh, audience. This is uh, an oversight statue of uh, Josip Vysenyorovich Stalin, who was the leader of uh, the Soviet Union uh, from uh, roughly 1924 uh, until his death in 1953. A few words about him because uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, not only here in Hungary, but uh, all around uh, the uh, Eastern Europe and uh, other countries behind the Iron Curtain, including the Soviet Union, uh, people dedicated super huge statues to Josip Stalin. When, um, when, he, uh, when he stabilized his power, in the mid thirties, he also applied or started with a personality cult. And uh, this personality cult uh, culminated uh, to this uh, uh, unlimited adorn forced adornment of uh, himself. And what you see on the picture is uh, nothing else but the 70th birthday gift of, for Stalin from the loving Hungarian nation, inaugurated in 1951. And this Stalin statue was toppled in 1956, just three years after Stalin's death. Stalin died in 1953, and uh, his death left behind an unbearable social and political tension. And uh, at this point, I would like to reflect and refer to uh, what uh, Sheryl and Sophie said, that uh, erasing or uh, destroying memorials uh, is like risking a loss of knowledge. But when Stalin died in 1953, his political successor in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, understood the unbearable political and social tension. So he uh, started to organize a systematic de-Stalinization. I'm sure that you understand this, um, this word. Uh, so historians also call it as a qualitative statue replacement. Uh, so Khrushchev ordered uh, to have all memorials, artworks ever dedicated to Stalin to be removed from the uh, area of the Soviet Union. But he couldn't control this event or events in continental Europe. And uh, these de-Stalinizations happened spontaneously. And the ever grandest the Stalinization is nothing else but the 1956 uprising in Hungary. And uh, there you see um, what uh, the people left behind. Um, on the um, top uh, left photo, you see Stalin's head that was carried from uh, the uh, location to another one, at least one kilometer away from the original uh, location of Stalin's grandstand. So you can imagine the anger uh, in the people's heart. And uh, then you see next to it, uh, the boots uh, with a writing on it, uh, boot square one, and beneath it's boot square two. So people actually named this square after the boots. And why about the boots? Because the the statue was toppled on the first night of the uprising. The uprising lasted for 14 days. And for the rest of these days, the boots remained in its place and reminded the public of the dictator and reminded the public of an eliminated dictatorship. And they have become eternal symbols 
for Hungarian people's strive for freedom and independence. And what you see, if you come to Memento Park and on this photo is only the boots replaced. Because what Memento Park is, the last moment of a dictatorship and the first moment of democracy. And uh, here you see the layout of Memento Park Statue Park from the bird's perspective. And uh, I don't want to, I mean, I really hope that uh, you can come and uh, visit us one day in Budapest. So I won't tell you everything uh, about the park, uh, but uh, my, my, um, my presentation wouldn't be uh, complete without telling you that uh, Memento Park has a very special conceptual design and uh, you can clearly see a road, uh, a very long one, interconnected by laying eight shapes, which are symbols of infinity or eternity. And the road is the road, the only and true road of communism, which is one stand inseparable. But uh, here in Memento Park, we call it the road of communism, but it's a road that uh, people are forced to walk on, people which is set for the people and only in dictatorships we have the road and the rules preset in a way that if we avoid, we get endangered. And uh, it was a political and social consent at uh, the uh, end of uh, these 45 years. And I'm sure that you have already asked that how come that Hungarians preserved their unwanted statues? Well, uh, you saw the destroyed Stalin statue. Well, Hungarians were not awarded for that. Uh, in 1956, after the 14 days of the uprising, Hungarian people were terribly punished and the revolution was mercilessly crushed. But uh, after two years of reprisals, uh, the uh, Soviet leadership agreed to give Hungarians some privileges in order to prevent an other uprising. So Hungarians uh, got a longer leash and um, a much smoother, a more livable political and social climate was applied here. And uh, historians agree that uh, this must have led uh, to this very um, liberal and smart uh, thought or idea uh, by Hungarian politicians and the Hungarian society uh, not to destroy or mad down the statues at the fall of communism, but uh, to protect them. And uh, not only to protect them, but uh, there was an, an urge in, in on um, on really unexpected urge that people wanted to uh, create a, a proper um, interpretation for these unwanted political propaganda statues. Why are these statues uh, in Memento Park? Uh, well, again, uh, thank you, uh, Cheryl and Sophie, for speaking about it in your presentation. Well, it was well the decision uh, made on which statue to keep and which statue uh, to let stay at the original location uh, was a, a matter of a two-year-long debate. So these decisions never come easy. It's, uh, um, I mean, you, you, you have to, uh, ponder many things, you have to speak and uh, discuss about uh, the political context, the social context, uh, negotiations made by uh, like uh, outstanding authorities uh, in sociology and in sculpting, in politology, and uh, it lasted for two good years. And the final decision, uh, due to the final decision, statues 
with uh, unvanishable political character would, uh, would delegate it to this collection. And those which uh, could have been um, rebranded just with removing a five-pointed red star or a bilingual inscription could stay at the original location because uh, it's also um, a matter of fact and an undeniable matter of fact that we're speaking about uh, 40, 45 years and people just got used to live around these statues. And uh, these are political propaganda statues, you know, so it's not that there are just one of them uh, in one city. It is that there are one of them in every district or in uh, every third kilometer. So people really saw them um, within a work day at least 10, 12 times. So people were surrounded by them. And, um, and, and, and despite that, uh, they decided to preserve a few. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, yes, uh, those with political character are here. And uh, those which the people just, you know, learn to like, love, or got used to see too much those stayed at the original location. And what happened to the other statues from the countryside of uh, Hungary? Um, just let me give you one example, because uh, there are very, like there are, there are many nice stories. Uh, there is a statue that actually traveled um, a few hundred kilometers from A to B. Uh, the uh, local community did not want to see the statue any longer, uh, but uh, after the fall of communism, uh, another city uh, came to the decision to uh, unite uh, the three villages so that they would be a bigger municipality, a uh, new unity, and uh, they, they, they just wanted to have a statue uh, that uh, could have become the symbol of this uh, unity, but they couldn't afford, but they didn't afford or couldn't afford sculpting a new one. So they said that, well, if someone just has or wants to get rid of uh, uh, an unwanted uh, communist statue, which doesn't have uh, political character, then we would like to get it. And the female figure representing liberation traveled from A to B and now without any political meaning and any, any, any symbol of authority represents the unity of uh, this uh, newborn town. And uh, we must speak about statues uh, in Memento Park, which uh, are not um, which are not restored or which are not complete. Because uh, Memento Park deals with a very hard part of history. And uh, it's, it, it was, we see uh, statues of people that, uh, that had to be accused at some point. And uh, this uh, jury selection made during those two years were indeed made uh, and based on, uh, on maximum possible objectivity. And uh, at the end of those two years, when the pool of statues uh, was, uh, was, was done, was made, then uh, they um, published an architectural um, contest and invited uh, architects to create a conceptual design. And uh, the victorious one is apolitical. So the conceptual design of Memento Park is apolitical. Well, then uh, you are right. If you pose me the question, then uh, why uh, does that uh, gentleman stand in obviously in Memento Park in the new location without legs? Because this person in the suit without flags is uh, someone who made unforgivable 
things against Hungarians. This person has always, had always been a hardliner communist and uh, he never changed. It was only the political uh, climate that changed around him. And in 1956, he came to act as a hardliner and uh, he led the reprisals after the crushing of the uprising. He sentenced to death the spiritual and political leader of the uprising, his former best friend, Imre Nagy. You must have heard about his name, perhaps. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, this person sentenced to death 400 Hungarians and uh, ordered the imprisonment of 2,000 and more than 200,000 Hungarian people became political refugees after the crushing of the uprising. A group of these political refugees, once the borders were free to enter again, returned to their fatherland and toppled the statue of this person. And the architect of Memento Park agreed that if there would be just one statue left damaged in Memento Park in an apolitical collection, propaganda, political propaganda statue collection, then it would be his. And here is the architect. Uh, his name uh, is Akos Elud. And uh, here you can read what well, he has a lot of uh, very important thoughts and sentences. If you visit our website, www.mementalpark.hu, then uh, you can read uh, even more about the conceptual design and about his thoughts. Uh, but uh, this is the, uh, the major message that uh, he wants to convey to people with uh, creating Memento Park. And here is him. 30 years ago. And uh, where Hungary's communist past um, is uh, undeniable, we have it. Uh, and uh, Memento Park speaks uh, uh, about it in a smart way. And, uh, and this is what makes uh, Memento Park a uh, very important uh, site. And uh, at this point, I would like to give you some insight about our daily life. So cultural and or dark tourism. So what is Memento Park? Uh, well, cultural and dark tourism actually have the same um, qualities. Uh, they are special attractions. Uh, they carry some wow experience. Uh, they're connected to legends. They're unique. And uh, somehow they remain actual in space and time. And uh, yeah, apologies, I did not uh, mention, perhaps the next uh, slide will, uh, that uh, Memento Park is operated by the same company uh, for 30 years without state support. And uh, that's why it's important that uh, we do SWOT analysis and that we define our uh, space uh, in uh, in, in economy and in tourism industry. So here you can read uh, our SWOT analysis as a cultural destination or dark tourism uh, destination. And uh, from this uh, list, what I would only highlight is uh, actually oblivion. That, uh, that just should not happen. I mean, so no loss of knowledge and no oblivion because then uh, it's the mankind at the end of the day who will lose a lot. And let me uh, invite you uh, behind the scenes. Uh, who are we? Memento Park is run by two cultural entrepreneurs. Uh, my partner started uh, this project 30 years ago and I joined him uh, 14 years ago and uh, in the past uh, 30 years of uh, operation while well, we had our ups and downs and uh, in 2007 uh, we uh, established a foundation so now Memento Park has two legs a for-profit which just you know 
does everything for the visitors so that visitors feel happy and are satisfied and uh, we operate a buffet and offer guided tours and everything and there is a non-profit unit uh, where i uh, where i am a volunteer and uh, the non-profit unit uh, is responsible for these sorts of uh, um, uh, cultural and scientific collaborations uh, that uh, now i'm very pleased to uh, to do for you and with you. Uh, we have other like here local uh, cultural collaborations and uh, in the past 30 years we, we, uh, we welcomed over 2 million visitors from all around the world. Uh, even on a rainy day, uh, people from more than 20 countries uh, can come to see the statues in Memento Park and Memento Park itself. Here you see uh, cultural uh, examples for cultural collaboration uh, uh, from uh, the right uh, to the left. There you see the, um, the, the, the folks uh, dressed in uh, costumes. Uh, this is a, an experimental core in Hungary and uh, this was their project, a catwalk concert because these are actually uh, like actual uh, cloth designed especially for this event. Uh, in the middle, you see a Russian um, contemporary um, painter, graphic designer, Anna Vesnova, uh, who had a very interesting project, uh, Shadows of Socialist Realism. And this uh, reflects on uh, the Stalinist personality cult and uh, is uh, in, in absolute harmony with uh, Memento Park's conceptual design being apolitical and uh, trying to make people understand that in tyranny's domain, we are all links in the chain and there is no way out for, for, for anyone. So that uh, we are all just as much witnesses as easily we can become victims of a dictatorship. And uh, in the last uh, column, you see uh, Lion uh, Lang, uh, whose uh, experimental project uh, was uh, one of the first one that Memento Park hosted in 2009. Uh, there she just, so uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it's purely artistic. Uh, she, she played uh, with the statues and uh, these female models and of course communism were and it's a it's atheistic uh, character was inspirational for her and here you see us working hard groups school groups adult groups and many more dissonant heritage uh, is what we are uh, and uh, this definition uh, is very young, uh, and that's why it only says uh, it's European history, but we know now that uh, it actually covers uh, the, uh, uh, the entire world. And uh, the recognition that uh, Memento Park received lately is uh, the last thing that uh, I would like to speak about and uh, bring to your attention. So here you can read what uh, what Memento Park is for many, uh, for our visitors. It's um, so it's that we are a small team, only the team of two, and we spend a lot of time uh, in the cash desk. We speak with our visitors. Uh, I am giving tours uh, in English and in other languages, my partner in Hungarian. And uh, so, so we, we speak a lot with, with, our, with, with our audience and, uh, and they very often uh, just come out and, uh, and tell us what they really thought before they visited Memento Park and uh, what uh, they uh, felt after visiting Memento Park and and it's it's moving it's really moving so we applied to uh, this uh, very important list the seven most endangered program 
curated by Europa Nostra and uh, the European Investment Bank. And for 2023, Memento Park is happy and proud and is grateful to be one of these. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I am here at your disposal. Thank you for your presentation. And now um, I'd like to welcome back all of the panelists and we will begin the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, anyone can feel free to submit using the Q&A function, a question for our panelists. And from there, uh, we will all respond and continue the discussions that you've heard during these presentations. Uh, Sophia and Cheryl, is it okay if uh, you rejoin the presentation? To do something yeah. to click us back in? Yeah. yeah. Could you let us, could you? Uh, the host yeah. Oh, I have to, I have to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a video. Thank you. Uh, there you go. It should oh, be there. Yeah. Uh, start maybe start. yeah. Okay, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, okay. So while we're waiting for the questions to come in, I did have one to ask you both. Uh, this is actually from a previous webinar. So in the past, we've had um, two webinars where our panelists were worried about hate campaigns due to how emotionally charged and challenging these subjects that we're discussing are. And people do oftentimes fight over the presence of controversial or oppressive monuments. Have there ever been any concerns with danger in your course of work? And if so, how did you address them? And what advice would you give to others in similar situations when they're dealing with their own public spaces? So I, I expect that the different situations are all also extremely different from each other and there's not going to be one answer. Uh, our situation is a little bit different because as Sophia explained in the beginning, we typically are in the position of trying to rebuild or rescue monuments that, have, that the community very much wants and is trying to save, but that are being attacked or that have been attacked by uh, sometimes a, you know, an extremist group or a terrorist group external to the community. So we have definitely had shaky moments in Iraq because when we started the reconstruction of the tomb of Nahum, that's in Nineveh province, and that's just 30 miles from Mosul, and ISIS was actually still in Mosul. So we had to operate very much under the radar. And in, sort of for us, in comparable situations where things have been a little bit iffy, there have been only two solutions. One has been to try to be extremely inconspicuous with what we're doing, just keep it within that community. It's a bit of a problem because it prevents you from getting the support, including the financial support and the social support that you otherwise would really need for a project like that. But there's just no alternative because if you publicize it, you're going to draw not just the attention from the people that you, whose attention you want, but you're also possibly gonna put a target on your site. So we had to operate very clandestinely uh, for, for certain periods of time. At other times, we are in communities that are, um, sectarian that are multi-sectarian or, or multi-faith where those different sectarian groups or religions can become at odds with each other. And then the only thing really to do is to sort of pull back and wait for the dust to settle because there's no way in certain of these heated discussions, heated moments that you're going to have a calm debate and, and come to a calm conclusion. You just have to wait for everybody to calm down again and then you can figure out your next step forward. Sorry, sorry. I was just wondering if you did have any anything, any similar experiences. Uh, well, our situation is much different because it's an enclosed conceptual design. So there are no new statues uh, coming in or coming out. And, uh, uh, but uh, well, yes, but it's, uh, uh, it's more like a, a, a more 
this whole process uh, that in the past 30 years, uh, some uh, cities, towns uh, saw some actual reconstructions and yet they wanted to get rid of uh, their uh, remained statues. We just said, ah, oh, that we would be fine with them. And, uh, and actually they have no places to go because uh, the storages of museums are filled and um, uh, there are no public, no other public spaces where people would like to see them. So uh, this was one of the major reasons why we uh, established uh, the foundation, because uh, because we are. I mean, this is not the nicest word, uh, but uh, because we aim to 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 exhibit uh, these uh, uh, new pool of statues. We have more than seventeen other. Uh, unwanted political propaganda statues deposed in Memento Park, but not in the conceptual design area, uh, but uh, outside it, actually hidden, but uh, in a good care because uh, we, we, we like, like respect the, uh, their artistic character and their historical character, of course. And uh, perhaps just one more thing, uh, which uh, is just constant that um, hang it, like, it, there are always pros and cons uh, how Hungarians uh, or people feel about their past, and uh, and it uh, always um, some uh, reflection or a echo of the actual political climate. Uh, so sometimes um, we see Hungarian uh, or uh, foreign visitors uh, entering Memento Park. Ah, oh, what is this? place and why are these statues uh, preserved so I mean why do we need it so it's not uh, it's not obvious uh, that if you preserve a very important uh, place a very contradictory place uh, it's it's not obvious for the people why you do that so the educational character but uh, you ladies also highlighted is uh, is very important that you must add some education to these sites once you decide to preserve them because one can't exist without the other yeah um i'd like to if i if i can for a moment say i think what's very important from our perspective is the decision you're, you're dealing with an object or a site or a monument that is historic and once it's gone, you can't replace it. It, it, is, it belongs to that particular moment in time when it was created. So the decision to get rid of it is really quite consequential because once it's gone, it's gone. Even like the Buddha statues, you know, yes, possibly one could rebuild them. One knows what materials they were made out of. It's potentially doable, but they're not going to be the actual Buddha. Th th those are gone. So, so it should be a decision that you make in a calm frame of mind and you make it having thought through all the different aspects of it, and you make it with the longer term of time in your mind. For example, there's, um, you know, there's a, an obelisk in the, there was an obelisk in the main square in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it, as an obelisk, it had four sides. And one of the sides was seen as discriminatory by the local Native American population and arguably was. So at one night, a group got together and demolished the obelisk. But the other three sites, they kind of were collateral damage. <laughs> and it was, it was quite unfair because one of the sides, for example, honored the Union soldiers who fought against the Confederacy. So that was you know, a message that one would have liked to keep. There wasn't really any reason to demolish that message as well. So in, you know, from our point of view, if you have four sides, you should think about, well, what do I want to do with this in its entirety? Can I change one of the sides? Do I just add a plaque explaining it? Do I figure, you know what, the, everybody's so upset right now, why don't I remove it? And then we think about it and we come back to it in five years or 10 years, we think about it then. I just, I just feel that, you know, that out of anger, demolishing something is not really the best way forward at all. And, and, and celebrating that was not really a, a very constructive thing to do, I believe, because you just never know. So just my last example is that in Vienna, Austria, uh, the, the, the Soviet army was occupying the city. And, you know, yes, in a sense, they helped overthrow Nazism, but their presence in the city 
was terrible for the population because they were extremely brutal. They, there was a lot of rape, there was a lot of killing, there was a lot of looting. Their presence was not remembered very fondly by even the people who were glad to be liberated from Nazism. But the Soviets built at that very time, they built a huge gigantic statue, a huge pedestal, and there's a Soviet soldier on the top of it. And it's right in the center of the city. And there's a big fountain in front of it. And they rode into when, when Austria got it regained its independence having been occupied, they rode into their treaty that made them independent again, that they must keep this statue. They weren't allowed to move or do anything to that statue. So that statue has remained. And that statue has undergone, you know, all sorts of uh, experiences. In the, like currently, that statue is where all the protesters against the Ukraine war go. So that statue is not something that makes the Russians real happy right now, because that statue right now is the focal point for all the critics to their attack on Ukraine. So it's just, a, it's a place. A, a statue is a site, it's a place. You can put all sorts of content into it and around it, and, you, and often that's exactly what happens to these. They, these places take on a life of their own and they almost have their own history following when they were built. Thank you for your responses. Um, speaking of having a life of their own, were there any interactions that you've had with the locals on any of these sites? that might have changed your perspective on a monument that was seen as controversial? Well, uh, in Memento Park, uh, because of this uh, apolitical conceptual design, uh, we, so these statues uh, at uh, a certain extent are controversial, but I would say that they used to be. Uh, controversial because now they are in this uh, new artistic context uh, in, a, in, in a total silence because there is no narration in the park. So people uh, who come here, uh, they, um, they primarily visit the park uh, on their own. There are four very basic information about each and every statue on the pedestal of uh, the uh, monuments. So it's the original location, name of the statue, name of the sculpture and year of installation. So people uh, with uh, any um, knowledge, family background uh, uh, from anywhere around the world come here and they don't need to know anything about it. They just, need to walk with, uh, with, with open eyes and open hearts. And uh, then we, they, they will see these huge soldiers cast in bronze. They will see these uh, fancy looking politicians in their suits. They will see the workers' monuments. Uh, all workers are strong and healthy. Uh, and, uh, and then they will develop their, their, their idea about it. Um, and... Um, and that, that's uh, how it works here. So they're decontextualized, uh, actually. So, uh, so for this uh, reason, we, at, at some certain extent, we have it easy. But of course, it's it is not. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, it's like that. Um, okay. I have an example too from, from Iraq. So when we were fundraising for the restoration of the tomb of Nahum, which was a principal um, pilgrimage site for the Jews of Iraq for thousands of years, um, we, we were also fundraising from within the US Jewish community and the international uh, diaspora Jewish community um, and the Israeli Jewish community. And we, we got a lot of support and encouragement from Kurdish Jews but from, from former Iraqi Jews from the Arab Iraq, they said, well, yes, it's an important site for us historically, but our memories of our time in Iraq are so terrible that we don't wanna remember anything about Iraq. And we don't care if anything, if everything in Iraq <laughs> gets obliterated, including Jewish monuments. So that was, that was interesting to see, you know, the amount of emotion that was attached still to that experience and how different it was for the Kurdish Jews whose ability to leave Iraq was a nonviolent one. They were, they were assisted in their ability to emigrate to Israel. Whereas the, the Jews in the Arab part of Iraq, 
had a, a much different and, and much more violent and repressive experience and didn't want to remember it at all. So that, that was interesting uh, and, a, and a very understandable difference, certainly. Uh, I would like to add uh, one more thing. Uh, so this, uh, as I told you uh, that, uh, or I haven't, uh, but these 45 years in Europe were different uh, for each and every country behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, it was only Hungary who preserved these statues. And I told you the reason why. Um, and, uh, and we can understand uh, the anger uh, of uh, the other nations who chose not to preserve these statues. And now after 30 years, uh, they, uh, they also come to Memento Park and uh, and say that, uh, gosh, it's good that you preserved them. Uh, there were countries which um, did not have this sort of uh, uh, political propaganda uh, art um, production. Uh, for example, in Yugoslavia and former Yugoslavia or in Romania, uh, you, you wouldn't get to see uh, statues uh, like this back in the day. Uh, so they also come and see uh, what it must have uh, been or felt like uh, to be in this part of, uh, uh, of communist uh, Europe. And uh, again, um, it's uh, different uh, for uh, the countries uh, even closer uh, to the former Soviet uh, Union because um, the 9th of May uh, is uh, commemorated uh, in some parts of the world until today as the day of victory when the Second World War actually ended. And uh, we never ask uh, the nationality of our visitors, but uh, around the 9th of May, uh, there are visitors who pay the admission fee as any other person would. And, um, and we don't even see what they carry with them, but uh, they carry flowers. And, uh, and they leave uh, uh, flowers at the statues of the two peace symbols uh, and uh, of uh, the Soviet soldiers, so Soviet soldiers statues. Oh, thank you. Uh, for our final question, I actually, I have one question for each of you that you could briefly answer if possible. Uh, first for Cheryl, what inspired the integration of criminal law into the reassessment of public space? We were looking for a template and just playing around with different ideas. And it was true that these were individuals who were accused of some kind of wrongdoing. So the analogy to the criminal court system seems, seemed apropos. And at first, almost more a little bit, maybe like a, just a playful analogy, but the more we talked it through, the more we realized that the different faces of it actually mirrored what was being done in the assessment and evaluation and judgment that was being executed uh, on these statues and sites. Perfect. And Judith? I wanted to ask you, um, what were the challenges faced by the sculptors during the Soviet occupation of Hungary? And this is based on uh, one of the pages on your website by the architect who talks about the different phases of the mental park. Uh, the sculptors, right? Well, um, that is the, the part of Memento Park. Uh, that uh, the, the, I, I can speak the most about. So we're speaking about political propaganda art and uh, politicians uh, needed quality statues uh, to echo the wills of the system and uh, the plans and the ideas uh, of the system. So uh, each and every statue in Memento Park and back in the, in the time was uh, sculpted by the most outstanding sculptors of the 20th century in Hungary, or 20th century Hungary. Uh, so, uh, so they, um, they, they, they had to meet uh, all the criteria that uh, used to be set by Moscow. 
So if it uh, came to a liberation memorial, then uh, just like Cheryl uh, described uh, the, the Viennese one, the Austrian one in Vienna, uh, that was a, um, like a topos. So if I say Soviet heroes memorial, then every single person who, have, uh, who has ever seen just one Soviet heroes memorial must have seen all of them because it's always the same uh, Soviet soldier carrying a weapon, uh, uh, the flag of the Soviet Union uh, and uh, wearing uniform, but they are always private. It's very important that they're not generals, they are not uh, the big uh, uh, marshals of the fight. They are, they are the lowest of their hierarchy in the military. So they are private uh, and um, as we uh, went farther from uh, the actual date of liberation, the character of these political propaganda statues changed, became smoother, but there were still requirements that had to be fulfilled in order to, um, to, uh, to echo political propaganda. So uh, a worker, always a uh, statue, right? Because uh, what is the period back then? It's uh, the Cold War. And the Cold War can turn into an actual war in every minute. So you have to uh, create a, a picture for the workers, about the workers, that they are strong, healthy, and that they can fight for their own rights and that they can fight for the state that promises them to protect them. Uh, and um, talent was appreciated. If a sculptor could do this job, then uh, politicians didn't necessarily mind if that person was not pro-communism. Uh, they, 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 they needed talent. They were uh, privileged uh, communist sculptors, but, uh, but if a privileged communist sculptor couldn't do the job, then they found someone who could do it. All right, well, thank you both for joining us for this webinar. I really appreciate that you took the time out to share your presentations and insights with us. I have to um, do that. Yeah, I wanted to also, Judith, we wanted to congratulate you on to be uh, on the Europe, Europe, I hope her Nostra seven most endangered sites because that's an important we know that list of course and it's really um that's good really good fundamental part so yeah i just wanted to say that congratulations yeah. thank you so much and thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity thank you all mm -hmm. and it was nice how you said like um you don't want to tell us too much because we should come and visit i like that <laughs> so now we really have to come and visit you know <laughs> yeah. and now we'll have director sakina Moore lead us out with uh, another announcement. Okay, and I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. And I want to uh, thank William uh, Judith Holt, Sophia Schultz, and Dr. B um, Cheryl Bernard for your insightful presentations. I also wanted to extend gratitude to the Mellon Foundation uh, for, your, for their generous support. Please be sure to follow us on at www.worldheritageusa to stay up to date on our events and future webinars. Upcoming webinars include uh, April 27th at 12 p.m. Uh, entitled Heritage as a Driver of Climate Action. And then our next Monuments Tool Toolkit webinar will be on May 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topic will be Nationalism and Oppressive Monuments. If you signed up for this webinar, uh, you will be receiving a survey and we encourage you just to fill it out and it will help us to better tailor and um, uh, further events that will make your experience better and that are timely. Thank you so much again and we do appreciate you and um, thank you for attending today and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>